All right, great. Well, welcome. Thanks so much for spending some time with us this morning. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Great. Well, I'm with Jonathan Sines, who's the director of Texas Values. And uh, we invited Jonathan to spend a little time with us this morning with our combined adult Sunday school classes uh, to learn a little bit about Jonathan himself and also to learn about uh, Texas Values as an organization and also some of the um, legislation that's before our state legislators in Austin this session. And so, Jonathan, please tell us a little bit about yourself first. Sure. Well, thanks for spending some time with me today. So the organization I lead is called Texas Values. Texas Values is the largest faith and family nonprofit law and policy organization in the state of Texas. And we've been in existence for a little over 10 years. We focus on the arenas of the courts, the legislature, and the media. And the core issues we work on are religious freedom, marriage and family, and life. Myself, I'm fifth generation Texan. Uh, both sides of my family and my father and mother's side have been here since the early 1800s. I grew up in the city of Houston, went to the University of Texas at Austin for my undergraduate degree, and then received my law degree from the University of Houston Law Center. And I've been licensed to practice law in the state of Texas for almost 20 years, was in private practice and litigation for a few years after law school. And then the work I do now, which is primarily law and policy, and then previously in my early in my career in litigation on these subject matters I've been doing for close to 20 years. And there's probably not any religious freedom or pro-life law that I was not a part of and not by myself. There are plenty of people that participated, but the Texas heartbeat law, protecting churches from being closed, the uh, laws that protect Christmas and public schools, the sonogram bill, uh, laws that make it clear that uh, Planned Parenthood and abortion groups can't get state funding. Those are things that I've been a part of individually and, and as an organization we've been a part of. And I've worked on court cases at the state, federal, and local level, and even all, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I've worked on religious liberty and pro-life cases. And as a matter of fact, some sources suggest that the Heartbeat Law, which our organization was the lead organization that helped get that passed, um, played a role in helping the overturn of Roe versus Wade, which we saw at the U.S. Supreme Court last year. So our website is txvalues.org. We do have an app. You can download our app. You can go to the website and find more about our Christian-based work. Great. Well, you guys send out some really good informational emails pretty frequently, and so I'm a avid reader of those. And uh, we're sense. also involved in a lawsuit situation with uh, Jonathan Mitchell uh, regarding religious liberty issues. And so we're kind of uh, real interested in what's going on in our state government, especially, but sure. also the federal government. So um, very good. Thank, thanks. First of all, let's just briefly recognize the past and uh, thank you for all your work with those issues and for all your successes too. We're, we're thankful to God for you and Texas values. Appreciate that. Good work. And uh, we've we've been involved in a little bit with uh, the Church Ambassador Network, uh, with some of our staff uh, going down to Austin to pray with some of the state reps there. So that's been a lot of fun for uh, our worship pastor Travis Ham and our administrative pastor uh, Troy Godwin and myself last month. So we appreciate that opportunity to do that. Brian English does a great job with that. So tell us a little bit about. Um, some of the bills that are before the state house right now, I'm thinking sure. in particular of two of them, one, the gender, gender modification ban, and secondly, the uh, issue with our public school libraries. And so could you tell us kind of back up a little bit and tell us why these are issues that need to be dealt with on the state level in the first place and why a, um, uh, some action is necessary. Give us a little bit of the background of those issues in particular then tell us about the bills, uh, the specifics of some of the bills. And then thirdly, tell us where we stand or the status of those bills. You bet. So, and I want to back it up a little bit too. I want to focus this part of the discussion, not only on the content of these issues, which are really important, but also the process. So strangely, well, I, would say, I shouldn't say strangely, but it's always uh, somewhat surprising to me. But there are a lot of people in the state, they've never been to our state capitol. And listen, that's okay. Not a lot of people or some people aren't like me that, you know, their family history goes back almost 200 years in Texas. That's fine. Our office is right across the street from the state capitol. You can see we got this great view. Where am I? Okay, this side of the, of the capitol <laughs> from our building. But, uh -huh. um, and so I mentioned that because, 
everyone has a role that they can play. And so when I start talking about the content and the bills and the issues and the particulars of that, I also want people to be thinking about, was there something I could do? Not only just caring about the issue, but is there something sort of on the function and process side that I could be doing from the comfort of my own home or if I want to get out on the road and go to the state capitol? So the legislature in Texas meets every other year. Okay. So that's every two years, right? It's called biennial. That's not biannual, biennial. It's spelled a little different. And so the legislative session meets in odd years for about five months. Technically, it's 140 days. That's usually almost through the midpoint of January through the end of May. Not a lot of time when you think about the state of Texas being uh, the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world, being one of the largest. I mean, we could be our own country. And a lot of that is budget issues. They've got to set a budget for two years. And you think about that. You're going to pass laws in less than five months that have to be in place uh, for the next two years. And that's looking backwards to see what the problems are and forward sort of anticipating what issues may come up and, and what you might want to deal with now, because if you wait another two years, the problem could get worse. And so I just want to make sure people understand that. And we encourage people to come to the Capitol. So we had a, an event at the Capitol two or three weeks ago, but you don't have to just come up for an event. Anytime you want to come during the legislative session, we're one of the only organizations in the state of Texas that has someone at the Capitol every single day during the session. So we invite you invite people to be a part of that. And uh, if you download our app, there's a book called a legislative guide. It's interactive. You can see how to get around the Capitol and how all that stuff works. And so, um, but it's similar to at the national level, you got a house and you got a Senate, you got 150 members in the house, 31 in the Senate, and they all have to agree, right? A bill has got to go through the house and the Senate, or if it starts in the Senate, it's got to go through the Senate and go through the house. Got to go through committees. But um, different than D.C., the public can pay play a really big role in how these things go. It's not that hard to get in the Capitol. There is a metal detector, but it's not an extensive process. And you don't get here and you don't have to you know, set up an appointment. You can show up anytime you want when the building's open and engage in the process. And we can help with that. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the issues. As a matter of fact, if you want to know more about the process, we have a YouTube channel. Look at Texas Legislative Advocacy 101 and 102. Those are instructional videos we've set up so people can learn more and get into more details on the process side. Very but good. on the content, we're about midway through the session, a little bit more. You're going to see a lot more happen. And that means committee hearings, votes on the House and Senate floor, a lot more action that's going to be reported. But there's still ability for people to come and register and go to public hearings and talk about what they're um, what, what they're concerned about, if they, they're for or against legislation. We do a big part of that as well. So um, let's talk about some of the bills on the issue of Gender modification. Let's start there. I think that might, might, might have been what you mentioned first. There's uh, there's several bills that have been filed. I'm just going to focus on the ones that are already starting to move. That doesn't mean the other ones don't have value and they could end up starting to move later. We don't know. But I also want to focus on these bills because uh, particularly in the Senate, they've been designated a Senate priority by the Lieutenant Governor. That's Senate Bill 14 by Dr. Donna Campbell. And that typically means that bill is going to have a lot more support and it's going to have the, the, the support of the, the lieutenant governor and people are going to be a lot more motivated to make sure that bill makes it to the finish line. So there is a companion to that bill in the House. It's House Bill 1686 by Dr. Tom Oliverson. It's not labeled a priority in the House, but, you know, in the past, the, the Speaker of the House and other speakers, Dave Phelan is the current Speaker of the House, a Republican from East Texas, they don't necessarily get involved in a lot of some of the priority numbering of legislation. I'm not saying they couldn't, but you don't see it maybe quite as specific in the Senate. But everything we're hearing is that bill is also a priority in the House, even if it doesn't have a low bill number. Senate Bill 14 has a low bill number. Usually if you see a bill with a lower number going from one up, right? So 14 out of, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 bills are going to be filed. That's a That's considered a low bill number. So, um, but they both had movement this week, okay? So Senate Bill 14 passed on second reading. They take two votes in the Senate when a bill goes to the floor. The first one's sort of the more important one. And then the second one is sort of a formality, but sometimes things do happen um, and change after that, but it's rare. So mm -hmm. the Senate Bill 14, the Senate version, passed the Senate on its first vote. It has to have one more vote. That'll happen next week, probably Monday or Tuesday. And then the House version had a hearing 
on House Bill 1686, an incredibly robust hearing, if, you, if I could say it that way. It went to midnight. It could have gone longer. Here's what we're trying to do. There are no regulations really right now in the state of Texas with puberty blockers, hormones, drugs that kids will take to make changes in their body that are oftentimes re irreversible because they think or their parents think that they were born a boy, but they really want to be a girl. So these are sex changes. These are transitions to their body, if you will, um, that are happening at a very early age. They're also We also know there are surgeries where body parts are being removed of kids and there's no regulations and a lot of states have already moved on this. Texas wants to get and join the party on that and, and be a part of what's going on in addressing that tremendous concern. And so that's what those pieces of legislation are there to address. Senate Bill 14 in the Senate, House Bill 1686 in the House. So the House bill um, has not come out of committee yet, 1686. I imagine it will be voted out very soon. And as I mentioned, the Senate Bill 14 has already gone through the committee process in the Senate. And now it has a Senate vote and there were more than enough votes. So come next Monday, I imagine um, that's going to get voted out of the, the Senate, Senate Bill 14. And then we're going to move over to the House because you, you've got to go. If you're starting the Senate, you also got to pass the House, but you could start in the House and pass the Senate. So you can have two bills kind of going, doing the same thing. And, you know, sometimes they might kind of cross each other. They might catch up with each other. And then you don't have to pass the same bill twice, which is your hope. But a lot of times the same bills are passed in the House and Senate because you never know which one might move. Something comes up you don't expect. You want to have two opportunities to do that. Is there a lot of is there any reconciliation work that needs to be done between those two bills or is it or but not they... at this point? No, mm -hmm. not at this point. You know, and some of those things will happen a little bit later if necessary. But what you might see is along in the process, they might tweak the bills here and there, and then they'll try to match them up as being identical if they need to. But as long as they're, you know, fairly similar, it, it won't make that much of a difference as far as the process side. But it could as far as what people feel like this is what the ending language should be. And then um, also, is there hope for a bi bipartisan uh, support on this bill or is it yeah you know listen I, I do think there's a lot of uh possibility for that i think there are a lot of democrats that have substantial some of these same concerns that republicans have voiced and and, and, the, and concerns growing if you've ever sat in one of these committees and I, we'll work on uh we've got on our social media channel a lot of videos on twitter and facebook that we posted from the hearing on monday on house bill 1686 it is just it's like the wild wild west in my opinion there it just really seems like there's no regulation there's no real sense of science or medicine a lot of it is just that this is the way i feel it's all on feelings as a matter of fact um at the beginning of the hearing in the house on house bill 1686 on the the bill to ban gender transitions that are harmful to kids um both sides if you will sort of got to have a two or three people at the beginning that were considered invited testimony experts they got a little bit more time and there was a little bit more discussion with them because there were a hundred I mean there were several hundred people that signed up to testify hmm. but at the beginning the the opposition the people that are okay with these kids being transitioned and going through surgeries and puber, puberty blockers and all this their doctor came up her name is Dr. Jessica Zwiener and there was a really interesting back and forth that led, in my opinion, to some concerns and questions about her credibility and about her honesty on how they do things on these issues. But then towards the end, she was asked sort of an interesting question. What is a woman? Which these were sort of questions about her credibility. What does she think about these issues? She said in response, that's complicated and gave sort of this long answer, right? Which uh, didn't seem to match up. And then the follow-up question is, can a man have a baby? And she said, yes. She didn't hesitate. That question apparently was not complicated to her. And so, and it's interesting, and I know I'm talking to a Christian audience here, and the legislation is not based on religious beliefs. It's based on science. But we as Christians know that God made us male and female. You know, it's not hard for us to answer those questions. And so a lot of times the attacks on these legislations, pieces of legislations, are directed at Christians who have a biblical view of these issues, which also happens to match up to science too, right? right? right. And so you'll hear some of that in the hearing, but I, I just felt like when, when she said a man could have a baby, I was like, this hearing's over. I mean, their side's done. Yeah. And it continued, wow. but you know, this is these are the views and the beliefs of people that are saying it's okay for kids to go through these uh, sex changes and transitions. I saw a um, social media post the other day. I think a kid was like three or four years old 
And someone was saying, oh, they've made a decision to go through a sex change. And I mean, are wow. you kidding me? And so, so uh, anyway, in, in the I know state you want to jump in. No, no, in the state of Texas right now, um, there is no, uh, there's nothing prohibiting a child even no. from going ahead with those procedures and medications. Yeah, I mean, they're, that- they're going on right now. They're going on right now. And I think that's, you know, that's what we do a lot of times. You hope to all the time, right? There's a problem. You look for a solution and it may not solve everything, but it certainly puts a standard in place in law and says, this is something we're OK with or this is something we're not OK with. You know, and, and I'm not one to say government needs to be involved in so many areas of our lives. But one role that I think we can all agree on is when you're trying to protect people, that is a role. And that's what this bill is about, is trying to protect kids from these harmful surgeries. The suicide rates for people that go through sex changes and you know, gender transitions, however it's going to be phrased, uh, suicide rate goes up 20 times that for someone who does not go through this type of surgery. And so there are legitimate mental health concerns that I think a lot of times are getting ignored. But I know you mentioned a couple other bills, so I want to make sure I get to those and we can circle back around. House Bill 900 is called the Reader Bill. This is about regarding um, what's coming into our public schools and giving parents an opportunity to say no to some of those things and to, you know, to continue or at least to, to reset things so there's respect for parents in the public school. I think a lot of people don't feel like that's the case anymore. We know there was a situation out in uh, whether it was Virginia, another part of the country, the FBI, there was some suggestion that parents were being labeled domestic terrorists because they were coming forward to their school board saying we're not comfortable with some of these inappropriate books and materials that are coming into the school. So House Bill 900, even though it's not a low bill number as far as one and up, uh, my understanding is it's been designated a priority item by the leadership in the Texas House. That bill is being carried by Representative Jared Patterson. And then in the, in, in that bill um, was heard in committee. I don't believe it's been voted. Uh, I'm sorry, it was voted out of committee. And then Senate Bill 13 is um, a very similar piece of legislation by Senator Angela Paxton. That mm-hmm. bill was heard in committee, but I don't believe that it's been voted out yet. So that's where we are on those two pieces of legislation. And again, that doesn't mean those are the only pieces of legislation that have been filed on this issue, but those are the ones that are starting to move and are getting a little bit more attention and are garnering a lot of support. Now, I will tell you, on that issue, we have seen at least one Democrat so, uh, talk on social media about her concerns. I don't know if she said she's going to vote for the bill, but she's at least acknowledged, yeah, this is a problem, too, that we as you know Democrats, if you will, should be caring about. And I think you're going to find a little bit more bipartisanship or common ground. And so and, we, and it's not necessary. Republicans have enough votes in the House and Senate to get these done if they all stand together. But you know, I do think there's value in it. And I think it's a, you know, an indication that, you know, whether you're right on, whether you're on the right or left, that these are issues that parents and families are concerned about across our state. Sure. Tell us the the need for such a bill right now. What yeah. what situations do we have in some sure. or many school districts where there are types of materials that are considered obscene from a biblical perspective? But are well, they, number one, you know, gay lesbian books, or they yeah. what, what? What is it? The whole gamut. Tell us about sure. the scenario, what, about the issue, about the situation right now at the grassroots. Number one, I I think we're at a peak moment, unfortunately, of this high level of disrespect towards parents, and some of it relates to what's going on in the LGBTQ movement, where you know the, these kids are saying at school, I want to be called a different pronoun or a different name. And then the school thinks, oh, they have to protect the kids. So they're not sharing this information with the parents. So a lot of that's been going on and building a lot. And so these bills really, uh, number one, address a problem where we've got to reframe this and we got to make sure it's clear in law that the parents, this these are their children. They have every right to have access to information about their kids and what their kids are being taught. It makes no sense that a teacher could say, oh, I'm going to give this piece of paper to the child in the classroom about an assignment. But wait a minute, if a parent asks to see it, oh, I'm not sure we can give it to you. (laughs) It's just it's absurd. But this is what is happening. Right. And some of the content, to your point, relates to, uh, I think, political ideology and a lot of pressure and a lot of focus on LGBT issues, even more so on the transgender stuff. But then we've seen drag queens performing at public school libraries and doing Mm -hmm. presentations at public schools. I mean, it's just out of control. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so parents have been pushing back, but then they've been they've been getting feedback from school districts, even in Texas, saying, well, we're not sure if we can give that to you. And there's a process. 
you know, there was one parent that got arrested because they were upset about some of these things at a school board meeting. Mm-hmm. And so those are some of the things that we've seen happen. But there are some books where they go through and they demonstrate, even though it's sort of, I don't know, borderline kind of cartoonish, but not exactly. I mean, it's sort of an artistic drawing of adults and sometimes um, younger people involved in sexual acts that are being depicted in these books. I mean, it's almost instructional. And so um, it's gone way too far. And so that's what these bills are trying to address and really empower parents. Yes, there's a clear cut agenda and a purpose behind all of these attempts to educate children on things that are totally inappropriate, even for adults. So, wow. Thank you so yeah, much. No, look, for being and, and it's troubling, you know, mm-hmm. and it's troubling because I do think, you know, school boards, city councils, great. Take care of your own business. Talk with your constituents locally. But when they start to ignore people at the local level, we can no longer say, well, you know, we're going to defer to local control. There is no local control. The control is not by the people locally. It's by whoever's in power and they're shutting them out. I have walked through these steps several times with parents who have been begging for information and they have to jump through so many hoops. We're involved in this process right now with the school district here in the Austin area, Round Rock ISD. I don't know how long it's been. We've been waiting to get documents back from a Public Information Act request, and they find all ways to sort of delay things. And so, and that's to my point where I started. When we only meet as a legislature every two years, and I'm not criticizing that, that is our process. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense. But you got to be focused on these issues now, because if you wait another two years, trust me, they're going to get worse. And, and I don't I'm not happy for that. That's just a reality. And so I think that's why you'll see these focuses, these issues come into focus more and a lot of reason and a lot of activity and effort put into getting something done now. Yes. And so at its heart, would you say the reader bill is really a parental rights bill? Sure. I mean, I think you can absolutely you can absolutely characterize that that way, even though there's a little bit more that it offers as far as uh, having something in state law. That is a big part of it. You know, and I know Representative Jared Patterson's worked on this issue and tried to address those concerns for quite some time. We've had interaction with him on those issues. But, you know, it's tricky. You get in the legislative process and people start splitting hairs about language and the other side brings up some other issue. And then all of a sudden, you know, the the road to the uh, governor's desk can be really tricky. I mean, one of the phrases you hear a lot at the Capitol is it's much easier to kill a bill than it is to pass a bill. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a thousand yeah. ways to kill a bill. And so even if we've got all the support and there is a tremendous amount of support, even if you have bipartisan approach, I mean, we saw what happened last session. And I think it was related to election integrity issues. The Democrats just walked out. They left the state. They broke quorum because you do. The Republicans don't have enough on the House on the House side to keep a quorum. You need two thirds. So there's uh, we don't have a 80. Excuse me. We don't have a um, 100 Republicans in the House, which is what you need. Two thirds to keep a quorum. They left the state. That shut everything down for a while. And so um, the sooner we can get to these issues and get them done and get the governor's signature, the better off we're going to be. So so would you say that the the speaker, our current speaker, is supportive of these bills that we've discussed? That's my understanding. I mean, that's what I'm hearing, too, with with it. You know, I see the, the House Republican caucus pushing a lot of information on this bill on social media. And so, you know, I don't know if I've seen him specifically talk about it. Maybe he has. But I mean, that's my understanding. And again, we're in the Capitol every day. So we hear things people don't always hear, you know, that you might not see reported in in, uh, in the media or even on social media. But that's what we're hearing. And, and that's my understanding. And so we'll operate that way unless we hear otherwise. Um, but people need to continue to engage with their elected officials. You want to communicate with the speaker's office. Let him know how important this issue is to you. You know, contacting the legislators is not always about I'm upset because you didn't do something. It also can be thank you. You're on the right track. Keep it up. I have yes. your back. Right to to Absolutely. indicate that support. Yeah, we have to we have to be positive as well as critical uh, in these situations. Jonathan, our time is almost up. I'm looking at my clock here. I think we started. 20, we have like two minutes left. So is there anything else you would like to let sure. people in well, the grassroots, the common people yeah. here at Bear Creek Bible Church in Keller, uh, yeah. what what do they need to know about what's going on? Well, I want to mention one process. other topic issue, content issue, and then I want to circle back to the process and also give you some information people can chew on to engage as we move forward and make a difference. We are working a lot on the pro-life issue. We did a lot last session. I mean, um, babies are protected throughout every stage of pregnancy. 
Uh, and so there's some some kind of fine tuning we might need to be doing or some some areas, some very small areas. But one of those is the alternatives to abortion program. This is a funding program that the state allocates right now, 100 million. We're trying to raise that to close to 300 pregnancy centers, nonprofit pregnancy centers, many of them faith based across the state that are serving the needs of women. Now that you can't have an abortion in Texas, we expect there are going to be more babies born. Right. And so we want to have that support, not just say protect the baby in the womb, but afterwards as well. So there'll be a lot of focus around around that issue. But please download our app, go to our website, engage with some groups locally, talk to your elected officials, your House and Senate member. Uh, they and also their staff members are very approachable. They know that there's going to be a lot of attention during this time of year. And look, if you can make a trip to the Capitol, please try to do that. We'll help you with the process. We have a booklet that we can give you, uh, a printed one. You can also use our Texas Values app to navigate things that way. But the phrase at the Capitol that is the most popular is government belongs to those who show up. And so that is one of the biggest ways to make a difference. Bring a group, bring a homeschool group, bring a church group. You can come on the weekend if you will. It doesn't have to be Monday through Friday. So a lot of opportunities. And as I tell our team quite often, some days matter more than others. They just do in the work we do. And this time period, the next two months is going to matter more to the legislation, the legislative session than anything that's happened so far. And so there's still time and a wonderful opportunity for people to make a difference. Jonathan, thank you so much for all your work. And we'll be praying for you. When we finish this video, we'll pray uh, at the end of the Sunday school time. Thank you so much for your work and God bless you and Texas Values. Thanks for being a part of it. Remember, our website is txvalues.org. God bless you. you bet. Take care.